and welcome back to another lecture of STAT 479 Time Series Analysis. So far, we've looked at a lot of um, properties of the ARMA model, but we really need to take a step back and determine if we have some actual data. Is it stationary? And are there any auto -co correlations that are not zero? So how do we test for that? In this lecture, we're going to be focusing on these two topics. The first thing we'll be doing is looking for testing for non-zero autocorrelations at lags 1, 2, 3, and so on, right? Because unless we're in the white noise uh, setting, we're going to have some autocorrelations we want to understand and we want to test for statistically from some data. Then we'll be looking at the idea of stationarity, because as we talked about before, having a stationary process is very important for doing statistical inference. Um, and we'd like to know, given some data, is our process actually stationary or not? And there are many ways to test for that. We're going to be looking into that later in this lecture. So let's go to the notes. And welcome back to another lecture of STAT 479 Time Series Analysis. In the last few lectures, we spent a lot of time going through the mathematical details of the AR, the MA, the ARMA, and the ARIMA models. So now we're going to take a little break from some of the heavy theory, and we're going to look into actual statistical testing on these models. In particular, we have two different topics of interest for today's lecture. One is the autocorrelation, the other is stationarity, because these are two key components of time series and of this course. For autocorrelation, we talked about how to estimate it. We looked at it when we considered the um, ACF, the um, estimating the autocorrelation function in R. Um, and we can use that to determine many properties about our time series. But for now, the question might be, is there any non-zero, non-trivial autocorrelation present in our data? Um, so we have to consider, well, um, what are the various autocorrelations? What are the lags? We have to compute all of these. And besides just staring at those ACF plots like we did in previous lectures, now we can actually run some proper statistical tests to determine if there are significant autocorrelations at various lags. The other thing we need to talk about is stationarity, because as I mentioned before, stationarity is a really important property for time series. If we want to do estimation of parameters and components and other things, um, we need a stationary series so that we're always estimating the same thing at every time point. Otherwise, when time changes, the things we're trying to estimate change and life becomes a lot harder. Uh, so those are going to be the two things we're going to look at today. We'll talk about some of the standard tests. There's a lot of statistical tests out there if you start doing some digging. We'll talk about a few of the standard ones that are um, popular in R. And uh, maybe we'll also look at some actual data and see how it applies to that. Or maybe some um, uh, simulated data so that we can um, study that and understand how these tests work. Anyway, let's get into the notes. So, as I mentioned before, the topics for today are going to be stationarity and autocovariance. Covariance. Or, sorry, autocorrelation, I guess, to be precise. It's kind of the same thing, but um, we're going to be specifically focusing on the autocorrelation. And the first test I want to talk about, well, first of all, we're going to start in the topic of autocorrelation. Um, and what we want to do is consider what are called, well, there's two tests in this first category. We have the box pierce tests and the box, I guess, Jung or presumably, or the Jung, the Jung box tests assuming that L is silent, which I'm not actually sure if the L is silent. So um, I'll probably need to look that up to figure out exactly how to say that. Um, but regardless, um, these are two different tests and they're both aiming at the same question. And the question is, are there any non-zero auto correlations at lags one or greater? So in this case, we're assuming we have a stationary series um, so that we can 
compute auto correlations. If you don't have a stationary series, then presumably this test statistic will be extremely uh, significant because um, you're going to have some very, um, you probably would have some very strong um, auto correlations in your data. Um, but regardless, um, what are we trying to do? Well, what we're trying to do first is, um, well, step one, Step one is going to be estimate the uh, ACF, which in this case, in our mathematical notation, is going to be rho hat x at lag, we'll say h or something. So, right, this is the auto correlation at lag h. Okay, so we have that. Um, and we talked about in, I think, the first or second lecture, how maybe it was the second lecture, exactly how to estimate that um, from a uh, time series data set. Now, what we ultimately want to test, right, is we want to step two, or maybe not, I'll say step two, is sort of write the hypotheses down, right? write down the hypotheses. And what we're doing is we're testing two things. We'll have our H naught, our null hypothesis, and our null hypothesis is not, not beta. It's going to be um, that rho with no hat, the true auto covariance at lag, let's say one is equal to all the way up to lag two, lag three, all the way up to lag H um, and is equal to zero. So this is up to some order h. Remember, when we talked about estimating the autocorrelation, we can estimate it for any h, uh, any lag h that gets fairly large, except that the larger it gets, the fewer data points we have to estimate it, right? Because to estimate a lag of the autocorrelation at a lag of h, we need time points or data points that are h time points apart. So if h gets bigger, there's fewer of them in our time series to, uh, to work with. Um, so typically, we wouldn't take h to be something absurdly large, like 100 or whatever, but maybe something more manageable, like 10 or 20 or whatever. Um, but regardless, the idea is that we want to do this test that all of the lags up to some order h, or sorry, all of the autocorrelations at lags up to some order h are um, equal to zero versus our alternative hypothesis that there is at least some index, we'll say j, um, such that rho x of j is not zero. And I guess specifically I should say that j is in um, one to h because we're not testing outside of our maximum lag h in this case. Okay, so then the question is, well, how do we do that? How do we test this hypothesis? Well, there's a couple different ways. There's our box Pierce and our Young box tests, um, which we will try. So the first one is box Pierce. And box Pierce basically says, note, that the square root of n times rho hat x at some lag j is approximately normal 0, 1 by the central limit theorem. So why should that be true? Well, that could be true because remember that our definition of rho hat is just going to be the sum of a bunch of terms, of a bunch of data points. So in a sense, if we sum up a bunch of things and we properly scale those things that we're summing up, very often the central limit theorem will kick in and we can um, say, okay, this is approximately normal. Um, Again, not perfect, but at least it gives us a starting point. And if we have that these things are approximately normal 0, 1, then we know that n rho hat x at lag j squared is going to be approximately chi squared 1. 
with one degree of freedom, right? If I take a standard normal random variable and I square it, I get a chi squared random variable. Um, and if I have a bunch of IID chi squared one random variables and I sum them up, I get a chi squared with a H or with, I guess, how many did I say? If we have H of them, we sum them up, we get a chi squared with H degrees of freedom. Um, so the, um, the test statistic becomes, and I use Q because there's a whole bunch of these Q statistics that you can see people talk about. Um, so I use the notation QBP for box Pierce, and that's just going to be N times the sum J from one to H of rho hat X evaluated at J squared. So basically I compute H auto correlations from one up to some value H, I square them, I sum them, I multiply by n, and we claim that this is approximately chi-squared with h degrees of freedom. Yes. All right, so is it perfect? Well, not exactly. We're dealing with a lot of asymptotics and approximations. We're saying, okay, this autocorrelation is approximately going to look normal. And then if I square it, it should approximately look chi-squared. And strictly speaking, the estimators are not all independent because they're based on the same data set. So there's a little bit of hand-waving going on here. Um, it's still very valid in some sense, um, but it's not uh, perfect by any means. And that's why there's actually a lot of other tests out there including um, yeah, it, including the um, Young box test. And in this case, we're really doing the, I'm going to say doing the same thing as box Pierce. That is, we want to test the same hypothesis. We're going to pick some H, and our high, and our um, high, our null hypothesis is that all of the autocorrelations from one to H are all going to be zero. Versus all our alternative that at least one of them is not zero. But what changes is the test statistic. So we're going to do the same thing, but with a new test statistic. And in this case, our test statistic, which I'll call QLB, um, is going to look, well, slightly different. It's going to be n, n plus 2 times the sum j from 1 to h of rho hat x j squared divided by n minus j. Okay, so what we have is something that looks almost the same as what we did above, right? We have the same terms here, but now we're multiplying by an n plus 2 and we're dividing by an n minus j. Why are we doing that? Well, if you go and read, there's actually not a lot of um, information on this. I was looking at some textbooks, but if you go and read what... Um, Jung and Box actually wrote back in 1978. Uh, they take these two test statistics, they take the Box Pierce one and this new one, and they study it. They basically say, okay, we have this idea that asymptotically, I should say, I didn't actually finish the thought here, asymptotically, this thing should be chi squared h as the data size goes to infinity um, in some central limit like convergence sense. But uh, for finite samples, that's not true. But what we can do is we can look at, basically we can, you know, we can compare to the same thing, n plus 2, but with, um, with the actual autocorrelation in here instead of the estimated autocorrelation. And we can ask questions about, you know, basically what's the mean, 
and variance of this statistic. And at least in that short paper, they kind of say, ah, the mean and variance of this modified test statistic, the Jungbach statistic, actually works better than their box peer statistic. Box is the same box. He's sort of everywhere in, uh, in stats. Um, so it's a way of refining it. It's not so much that one is wrong and one is right. Both of them are going to asymptotically have a chi-square distribution. The question is, because we're never asymptotic, right? we never have infinite data, uh, which one is going to perform better in fi for actual finite sets of data like we would actually work with in practice? Um, if you read their 1978 paper, they claim that this um, second statistic, the Young Box one, is actually better. Um, I haven't tested it myself, and if you pick up a book on time series or econometrics, they might have other conclusions. So I can't claim more beyond what I saw in that one paper. Um, but it's just a way to say that, yeah, there's different ways to basically test the exact same thing. Um, now there's one other, well, I'll, I'll point out that this actually does exist in R. So um, basically these tests exist in R in the, um, I think is this, this one I think is just in the, uh, the stats package. I'm going to say stats package with a question mark because I'm pretty sure that's the case, but I should probably double check that because I actually don't quite remember, but it's kind of a standard test. So it would make sense if it just appears in the standard stats um, package, which just comes with the R distribu um, any distribution of R that I know of. Um, anyway, um, so if we actually look at the implementation of this, uh, it's in the function called box dot test and it allows you to do either of the two you can give it an argument that says either do the box pierce or the young box test um, depending on which one you want but there's something else that's interesting to note here that um, often we don't apply these tests to um, to a time series you're thinking, well, wait, what? Isn't that the whole point? <laughs> well, no, we don't apply it to a time series XT, but instead to the residuals of XT after fitting, let's say fitting an ARMA model to it, an ARMA I guess you could do an ARIMA as well, but we'll just say ARMA PQ model to it. Okay, so the idea is, is that this, this function in R will just take a sequence of data. You can give it any sequence of data you want. Um, and we can apply it to actual time series, but in some sense, this is like a test for white noise. We're trying to um, determine whether or not any of the autocorrelations are non-zero. If all of the autocorrelations are zero, we have an uncorrelated um, stochastic process, which kind of falls back into our white noise. Again, I'm not making any assumptions on the mean being zero here, but effectively it, um, it kind of throws us right back into the white noise category. So more likely what you'd want to do is you'd have a time series. It's not going to have um, zero autocorrelations. But what we want to do is fit an ARMA model to the data. Now, we didn't talk about how to actually fit an ARMA model, but in R, for example, you can just run a command that will fit an ARMA model to your data, much like fitting a linear model in regression. Now, after you fit the ARMA model, you're going to get residuals out. And those residuals should, if the model fits correctly or well, they should look like white noise or they should look uncorrelated. So the point is, is that typically what you would do is take your series XT, fit an ARMA model to it, then take the residuals and shove the residuals into box test. But when you do that, you have to adjust the degrees of freedom. So the point is that in this case, we'd 
estimate P plus Q parameters. So we should instead test, I'll say QBP or QLB um, with a chi-squared distribution, but now we're going to have H minus P minus Q degrees of freedom. So again, I'm not going to get into the finer detail of it, but the intuition should come a lot from what you learned in linear regression. In linear regression, typically the degrees of freedom for our standard error or for our residual sum of squares is going to come from the data size minus the number of estimated parameters. So in this case, if I am estimating P and Q parameters for my ARMA model, then when I want to run this test, I need to subtract that from the degrees of freedom for my chi-squared um, distribution. And this can be done in the, um, and we'll do a demonstration later in the lecture, but this can be done in the box test function with the argument, it's like fit db, I think. Yeah, fit or fit df. F-I-T-D-F. So the point is you would have to manually tell R how many degrees of freedom should I remove from this, from my chi-square distribution based on how many parameters did I have to estimate before I got these residuals. And I should point out that if you look at the box test, it doesn't just have to apply to time series. You can apply this to a lot of linear models. If you have, say, if we go back to linear regression class and you fit uh, a linear regression to some data, you'd expect that the residuals would not have any autocorrelations. You can use the box test to check for that. Um, because if there are autocorrelations, then you might be worried about the assumptions being put on your model, right? Because in classic linear regression, we want uncorrelated errors. So we definitely don't want that to be the, uh, the case. Also, because we're subtracting P and Q, we would need to choose H such that H is greater than, strictly greater than P plus Q, right? Otherwise, it's not going to work um, because you can't have a chi-squared distribution with zero or negative degrees of freedom. I don't think there's any crazy way to generalize a chi-squared that way. Oftentimes in math, you get some weird generalizations, right? Where you think, oh, that doesn't make sense. And then you, like when we talked about our differencing operator, you can have a first or a second difference, but you can also have fractional differences because of course you can. Um, yeah, but basically, yeah, you need to make sure that H is larger than P plus Q um, or else it's not going to work and R is probably going to throw an error at you. All right, so moving on from that, the next test we're going to look at is called the Durbin-Watson test. So let's lock this off. And this also falls into the case of testing for auto correlations. Most of the things we're going to talk about today are testing. Well, the next two things in the previous two things were all autocorrelation. And then we'll talk a little bit about stationarity at the end of the lecture, or at least the written part of the lecture. Right. So the, um, the Durbin-Watson test, and the name Durbin is going to show up again later when we talk about how to estimate um, the parameters for our ARMA process. Um, so it's doing the same thing, but it's specifically focusing on order one autocorrelations. So what am I saying? I'm saying that basically tests for the presence, presence, yeah, of order one autocorrelations. So unlike above for our box test collection, 
um, we're not going to be choosing some H and we're going to be testing for autocorrelations for lots of values. In this case, we're just testing for autocorrelations at um, lag one. But in some sense, those are the most important ones because very often, if you're going to have higher order autocorrelations, you're probably going to have one at lag one. You don't have to, right? You could have a peculiar series that ignores lag one. It's almost like in that case, you'd have two time series kind of on top of each other because if you had say an auto if you had an auto regressive process of order two where the order one term was zero was not there then basically you're saying two time steps in the past is influencing the present so it's almost like you would count two four six eight whatever you know one three five seven etc um and you'd almost have two time series that are running two ar1 series that are running sort of like flipping on and off from each other so that's kind of a very peculiar case but effectively that little rant is what i'm trying to say is is that typically the autocorrelation at lag one is going to be there if you have higher ones it doesn't have to be but it typically would be there so the test itself is still very useful even if it only looks for order one auto correlations all right so how does it do that um well what we need to do is it basically does it for linear regression and it looks at the residual so kind of like i mentioned above with our um box tests in this case, we're going to look at the residuals after fitting a linear model to our data. So if we, I'm going to say, consider the model, the um, time series, xt, and we're going to have a pth order deterministic piece pth order is probably overkill. You typically wouldn't have, you know, high order um, things going on here, but you could. And mathematically, we'll just include it. So the idea is we have this big deterministic piece here. And then we have our residuals process. RT is the residual process. So what we would do first, this is before we run the Durbin Watson test. Um, actually, I think in the syntax, and we'll double check this, I think in the syntax for the Durbin Watson test, you just give it a linear regression formula. So it would take care of this for you. Um, but what we'd want to do is, well, first compute the least squares estimator um, beta hat just like we would do in regression class um, and then we would get residuals which i'm going to denote as r hat right because they're the estimated maybe i shouldn't call rt the residual process it's more like the air process and then r hat t would be the actual residuals that we compute from our data right the residuals are just the difference between the observed value and the estimated value which i guess i can write as a dot product between beta hat and my vector of one t t to the p whatever so again this is the the observed and this is the i guess predicted and the difference between the observed value and the predicted value is going to be our residual process so now that we have these residuals and again this is just doing linear regression um, like we would have done in linear regression class now that we have this, we assume the model um, that r hat t is equal to rho r hat t minus 1 plus w t. So that is, that is um, an a r1 model 
for the residuals. Okay, so if we have an AR1 model for the residuals, well, what do we do? We want to look at rho and determine whether or not it's going to be zero. If it's zero, there's no autoregressive process. If it's not zero, there's some autoregressive process going on here. So uh, let's look at that. Right. And actually, now that I look at my notation, I realize that um, I probably shouldn't have used rho because I was using rho for the autocorrelations. And now I'm using rho for my um, parameter here. So I will change that um, to, I guess, phi, because phi was what we were using for our auto, um, our auto regressive process parameter. <laughs> um, but yeah, so basically the idea is that we assume this model and then we want to then test h naught, which is that phi is zero versus h one the alternative that phi is not zero so right this is no auto correlation and there is and maybe yes <laughs> auto correlation etc um, so that's what we want to test right we're turning this into just a simple hypothesis test is phi equal to zero or is it not equal to zero? So then the question is, well, how do we do that? Well, what we do is we compute another test statistic. And our test statistic this time is going to look like Q. Well, we're going to denote it as QDW for Durbin Watson. Um, and what it's going to be is it's going to be the sum t from 2 to capital T. And by the way, you don't have to memorize all of these crazy test statistic formulas. I mean, this time we're teaching the class remotely, so I have to assume that it's everything is going to be open book when it comes to things like a final exam. But um, in practice, just it's not worth trying to memorize all these things. You can always look them up in a textbook or notes. Anyway, in this case, what we have is we have the sum of the squared differences at lag one in the numerator, and the denominator is just going to be the sum of the squared residuals, r, t, hat, squared. So this in the denominator is actually the um, residual sum of squares like you would use in regression class. Um, and in the top here, we have the, um, in some sense, the first difference, difference summed and, I mean, squared and summed. Um, so what does, what happens? Like, what does this Q do? Well, there's some interesting properties here of this thing Q. So first, Q, DW, has to be in between zero and four. Okay, why would that be the case? Well, because if you imagine the fact that on the top, the most you can really have is if r hat t and r hat t minus one, well, first of all, it has to be positive. That's the easy side of this logic. Um, everything's squared, so it can only, and it can only be zero if all the rts are exactly the same value. So we know it can be at least, at the smallest value can be a zero. Now, if we go the other direction, if the RTs are equal to each other, but with a flipping sign, that's as big as this thing can get. And the numerator is going to look something like four times RT squared. And the denominator is going to be RT squared. And when you cancel all of those out, you end up with just a four. Um, but what do these numbers mean, right? Eventually, we want a p-value, but um, we can look that basically if q dw is close to zero, then rt is close to rt minus one, I guess with hats everywhere. Um, therefore, we have positive autocorrelation.
if, in contrast, our QDW is close to 4, then we have that R hat T is close to minus R hat T minus 1, and therefore we have negative autocorrelation. And lastly, if you kind of follow the intuition, we have that if QDW is right in between 0 and 4 or is close to 2, then we don't have auto any autocorrelation. Um, so in this case, the insignificant value of our test statistic is 2, whereas 0 and 4 are both very extremely significant values for our test statistics. So this is a little bit strange, right? Because oftentimes we're used to thinking of test statistics at 0 as being insignificant, and as they get big, they get more significant. In this case, the, um, the center is actually 2. Um, I mean, you could subtract 2, I guess, just to... Um, offset that if you really want. Um, but yeah, so then the question is, well, can we actually get a p-value out for this test statistic? The answer is yes, but it's not a straightforward calculation. Um, so we're not going to go through the, the gritty details of where the p-value comes from, but just note that, note, oh my... Now it's too big. I lost my uh, the size of my pen here. There we go. That looks better. Okay, so then what I was going to say is note that a p-value can be computed, but the distribution... I think I put the uh, quote here into my um, notes. It's a linear combination of chi-squared random variables, which is, uh, I'll say, is a linear combination of chi-squared random variables, um, which means that it's actually super annoying to compute the p-value for. I mean, a computer can do it. It's not annoying for a computer. Um, but if you have, let's say, a weighted sum of chi-squared random variables, it's not always easy to get a nice tail probability out for a p-value like you would if you just had a single chi-squared random variable. Um, luckily, the computer can take care of that for us. Um, and my understanding from reading the documentation in the code, oh, I should say, this is in the dw dot test or no no dot sorry just dw test this is the dw test in the l m test package in r and according to the documentation, if the data size is really, really big, it doesn't really want to do some massive combination of weighted chi-squareds. Instead, it just uses a normal approximation and says, okay, if the data is large enough, it's close enough to normal that we can just forget all those chi-squareds and just do normal. Um, so you do see this a lot in practical implementations of test statistics where it's like, we got this great test statistic. How in the world do we compute a p-value? Uh, we have to use some com computational power or tables. Um, and that's going to come back. We're going to see that again in uh, some of the next things we look at as well. But yeah, so just to summarize, again, we have a test statistic. We can compute um, and we compute it and we use that to determine if there's a autocorrelation at lag one um, for the residual process after doing, say, a linear regression. Now, the next statistic we're going to look at, and we'll see if I get this name correct as well, is the Bruch, I guess, 
Godfrey test. B R E U S C H. Brush. Godfrey test. I wouldn't mind so much if I were just presenting it in class, but now this recording of my possible butchering of all these names will be recorded uh, forever. So uh, we'll enjoy that. But anyway, the idea is that this test, and I'm not going to go into all of the gritty details, but basically does the same thing as the Durbin-Watson test. in the sense that it is going to take a linear model like I started with up here, look at the residual process, and then try to determine if there's significant autocorrelations in the residuals. But, here's the but, but it does it for ARP um, models on the residual process process um, r t hat uh, so the nice thing about this test is that it will allow us to look at um, autocorrelations beyond just one like one um, so it has a little bit more um, applicability in that sense now mathematically what is it doing um, mathematically, we basically fit a linear model, least squares regression as usual, least squares regression. And after we fit our linear model, we basically get the r squared value. So do you remember what the r squared value is from linear regression, right? The r squared value is going to be the, I guess, regression or explained, I'll say regression sum of squares. Sometimes I like to use explained sum of squares so I don't get confused with residual sum of squares. It's the regression sum of squares divided by the, um, the total sum of squares. So typically it's interpreted as the amount of information that we're learning about the relationship between the inputs and outputs of our regression model, um, I guess from our regression model. Um, it's sort of saying how much information about our output is explained by our input. Um, if the regression sum of squares is very close to the total sum of squares, that means our data probably looks like it's in a straight line and just about all of the variation in our data is explained by the model. If it's just a lot of random noise, then this value would be very close to zero. Um, but still, um, needs to be positive or at least non-negative. Um, anyway, the idea is, is that um, the, I'm just going to write BG test uh, compares N, I think it's N times R squared to a chi squared P where P is the number of parameters in the model. Um, no, wait. P is the order of the autoregressive process. See, I'm running into trouble. I knew I shouldn't have used P up here because um, it's going to be confusing. See, this is the problem. I used P up here. Um, so maybe I should change that to, I don't want to use Q. Um, that doesn't really matter. Maybe I can just throw in like a D or something just to indicate that that P has nothing really to do with anything that we're doing. Um, so I don't want it to be confused with the order of the autoregressive process. Um, because in our Durbin-Watson test, well, we just consider an AR1 and 
Um, I didn't actually go through the gritty details of the computation of the p-value anyway. But in the case of this Bruch godfrey test, um, what we have is we have an a uh, we compare n times the residual or the r squared value. Sorry, the r squared value to a chi squared p, where I'm going to say p is the order from the a r p model. Um, and that's kind of it. Like it just does that. Um, I will say that in um, R, in R specifically in the function, what is it? it should be like yeah, BG test, BG test. Um, it can alternatively use the standard F test from linear regression. So that's the idea is that, um, oh, I should emphasize, I don't think I emphasize this, that we fit linear regression model. This is for the residuals. Just to make it clear, we're fitting that model to the residuals. What we'd expect, what we'd expect is the R squared value to be very small if there's no autocorrelations. If there's no autocorrelations, then we say, well, the R squared value should probably be pretty close to zero. We scale it up by n and claim that it has a chi squared distribution um, under the null hypothesis that there is no, there are no autocorrelations up to lag. P, um, but um, but yeah, and then we can also do the classic F test, and the um, the package does allow you to sort of switch between the two of those. Um, and just to add in one more test before we move on to the next section about testing for stationar stationarity, I'm going to say note there is also a Bruch pagan pagan yeah pagan or pagan test which is effectively the well it's effectively a similar idea i'll say which tests for Hetero skedasticity. Let's see if I can spell that right. I think it's a K, right? I always want to put a C in there, but skedasticity in the residuals of a linear regression. And this is also in the same R package under the term BP test. So this is different than what we'd want to use in time series, but I thought it's still worth noting that there are other ways to test the residuals of um, a linear regression model. And that seems to be this entire package LM test, maybe not the entire package, but a lot of LM tests seems to be dedicated to testing the residuals for linear regression. Again, the, the, um, the BG test is very relevant to time series but it is also useful outside a time series as is the box tests and these other ones we looked at because ultimately if we fit a linear regression model we'd hope that the residuals would look uncorrelated um, but very often there may not be specifically in a time series context and that's why these uh, tests are very good to use okay um, so now that we've done all of that, let's talk about testing for stationarity. Because this is going to be, I'll give it a capital T, because this is an important section, uh, or at least important tests that need to be done. Um, because we already looked at them a little bit in the lectures and in your assignments. I said, for example, well, we haven't discussed this yet, but 
you can try running something called the augmented Dickey Fuller test to see uh, what that does. And that should tell us, at least give us some evidence if a, if a time series model or data, I should say, if time series data is stationary or not. Um, so then the question is, well, what is that doing? Because I hate running statistical tests and not having at least some intuition about what they're actually doing. So let's talk about what they're doing now. And first, we will drop the augmented and just consider the Dickey Fuller test. Um, so start with the first one. And again, the, similar to the Durbin Watson, the Dickey Fuller test considers the AR1 um, process. So if I give, um, actually, I should probably explain the concept of a unit root test first. Okay, so I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. In this case, these tests, I should say that the following are what are called unit root tests. And this, if you recall what we talked about in the last two lectures, gets right back to the idea of the roots of the autoregressive operator or polynomial. Because as we noted in the previous lectures, if you have an autoregressive operator and if you have root, you want the roots to all be greater than one in magnitude. If they're not greater than one, in, that, that would give you a causal process. If they're not greater than one in magnitude, if they're equal to one, now we have a non-stationary process. So the point is, is that we want to determine whether or not the roots of the autoregressive operator have a magnitude of one or if they're greater than one. And that's why we have the concept of unit root tests. Basically, are my roots units or are they um, larger than units? Ideally, they'd be larger and then we would have a stationary process. And the Dickey Fuller test does this, but it does it by just looking at the first order autoregressive process. So what it says is that um, basically if xt is equal to phi um, xt minus 1 plus wt, then, well, what do we know? We know that if, well, we don't want phi to equal 1. If phi equals 1, we have a random walk. It's not stationary. If phi is less than 1, then we're good in some sense, right? Or even if it's greater than 1, it's, it's explosive, but it still means that we have a stationary causal or stationary non-causal process. Um, but what um, Dickey Fuller test says is that if this is our process, then if I consider the first difference of this process, well, there are different ways to write it. Effectively, when I take the first difference, I'm going to this above equation and I'm just subtracting x t minus 1 from both sides of it. So what I can write this as is phi minus 1 x t minus 1 plus w t. So this is what the first, this is a representation of the first difference process. And if I take this coefficient and denote as phi prime, then what I have is a new type of um, time series equation. And what I want to do is I want to test H naught, which is phi prime is equal to zero against H1, the alternative that phi prime is not equal to zero. So when I write that down, it looks a lot like just a classic statistical test. I want to know, is my parameter zero? Or is it not zero, the alternative being not zero? But what's interesting here is that this is equivalent to saying H naught phi is equal to one or H one 
phi is not equal to one. So the null hypothesis is actually non-stationary. And the alternative is going to be stationary. So in this case, we'd actually want to have a very small, significant p-value to reject the non-stationary null hypothesis and say, ah, our data looks stationary, which is a little confusing intuitively because typically when you do things like goodness of fit in statistics, you'd want an insignificant p-value to say, ah, yeah, my data looks like it fits the model. But in this case, we actually want a... Um, in this case, we want a significant p-value to reject non-stationarity. So again, it's a little confusing um, just because it's a little backwards from the intuition that we would often have uh, when we approach statistics. But okay, so we have that. So then the question is, well, what do we actually do? Um, well, effectively, we test this. Keep changing that. There we go. So we test this by estimating phi hat prime from the data, the first difference process. So we would take our data, apply a, I mean, the, the function does this all for you, so we don't actually have to do anything, but what it's doing, right, is it's taking our time series, applying a first difference, now we have our nabla xt, and then it's using that time series to estimate the first order autoregressive parameter phi prime, or phi prime hat in this case. We didn't talk about how to estimate these things, we're going to do that in a later lecture, but if we just assume that it knows how to estimate that, that value, then it takes the data, it estimates it. Um, it also computes a standard error for phi hat prime. It divides one by the other, that is, divides the estimate by the standard error, and it does a standard hypothesis test from that. I think the distribution, if I recall, is a little bit non-standard. It's kind of like a t-distribution, but I'd need to double check the actual um, documentation to see what the distribution is. A lot of times with these tests, the distributions under the null are not the greatest things to work with um, compared to like I don't know, just a classic chi-squared test or something like that. But that's roughly um, what's going on, right? And the point is we're testing does the autoregressive polynomial phi z, which is going to look like 1 minus little phi z, have a root at z is equal to 1, right? That's what we're trying to test here. Now, um, of course, we might be interested in not an AR1, not just a polynomial based on the AR1 process, but on an ARP process. And that's where the augmented Dickey-Fuller test comes in. So the augmented Dickey Fuller test is basically do the same thing. I feel like I'm saying that a lot in this lecture. But for an ARP model. Okay, so uh, yeah, we can do that, right? So what we do is we basically go through and do the same thing. But now xt is going to be written as the sum i from 1 to p of phi i x t minus i plus w t. Okay, so that's just our autoregressive process of order p. Um, and then when we apply the first difference, what we get is a, well, a slightly more complex form of this thing. So we're not going to just write it in terms of doing the first difference um, like we did before. What we're going to do is we're going to write it in a very special way. 
we're going to write it with a phi 1 prime at x t minus 1, which is not a typo. There's no nabla there. Um, yeah, we were writing down this equation here. So what we have is we have our phi prime at um, phi 1 prime times x t minus 1. And then we have the sum i from 1 to p minus 1 of phi i plus 1 prime times uh, the first difference nabla x t minus i and then we still have a white noise term here so again this is oh and i didn't define what these things are i should say where phi one prime which is the thing that we're actually interested in here um is going much like in the last case is going to be the sum j from one to p of phi j minus one um, and phi i prime is going to be this is for i two and larger is going to be the sum j from one to p of the phi j this is four j greater than or equal to two okay so then the question is, is that actually true? Well, yeah, you can work your way through it. I think there's an angry toddler upstairs. Um, I'm not sure if that's being picked up by the mic or not. Um, anyway, oh boy. Yep, bedtime's not going well. Um, anyway, where were we? Where we were is that um, if we actually wanted to double check to make sure that I'm not just making this up, we can plug in these parameters into the above um, equation and work our way through to show which terms cancel out with which other terms, um, which would look something. I guess I can take the minus sign out because they all have a minus sign. Um, would look something a little bit like this, which is the sum j from 1 to p of phi j. And then we would need the delta or nabla x upside down triangle x, um, which is going to be x t minus i minus x t minus i minus 1. So it would look something like that, and we can start to, if we really wanted to, cancel out terms and show that we just get the first difference process because what we're going to have is we're going to have a, um, um, I guess in some sense, if we go all the way back to i is equal to 1 here, then we're going to have an x t minus 1 times all, the sum of all the phi's, and then we're going to subtract all the phi's, and we're going to get the extra minus one in there. So you can kind of work your way through it if you really want to. Um, it's nothing too exciting to do. And in some sense, we really don't care about anything um, on this side of the equation. What we care about is this term right here, because much like what we did above, um, what we note that the autoregressive polynomial evaluated at z is going to be 1 minus the um, sum j from 1 to p of phi j z to the j. So if z is equal to 1, then phi evaluated at 1 is going to be zero. Um, and we're going to use the same intuition that we did for the Dickey Fuller test for this augmented Dickey Fuller test. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, we basically, well, we do the same thing we did up here. And what did we do up here? Well, we said we're going to run a hypothesis test for phi prime being zero or not zero, which is going to tell us if it's non-stationary or if we reject non-stationary stationarity in favor of our process being stationary um non-stationary not non-stationarity that's not a word got to keep track of that 
anyway, um, so effectively we would do the exact same thing. Then test h naught that um, phi prime one is zero against the alternative that phi prime one is not zero. Um, and yeah, we can just do that again as before. You can estimate that thing from the first difference process. So basically, I'm not going to write it again. It's exactly what I wrote up here um, somewhere. Yeah, right up here where I said we estimate that thing from the first difference of the data. Um, and then we compute a standard error. We compute a test statistic, we compute a p-value, and we can determine whether or not our um, time series is stationary. Now there's one more thing to note about the um, ADF test, uh, the augmented Dickey-Fuller test, and that's in the R version of this, which is the ADF, I think, dot yeah, dot test. So in this version of the test, the ADF dot test, um, well, what happens is that it first um, fits a line. I say line because it's a linear model, but it's literally a straight line, um, not a more complex linear model. Um, to the data to remove any linear trend first. So what it actually is doing is it's considering xt is equal to beta naught plus beta 1t plus the sum i from 1 to p uh, and now the autoregressive bit comes in, phi i, x t minus i plus w t. So what it does is it includes a deterministic linear piece in the um, fitting of the data to this model. So it does that to basically remove any sort of line that might be in the data. So if there's an increasing trend or a decreasing trend or whatever, it takes it out and then it runs the test. Um, to determine if um, the series is uh, stationary or not. So it can be a little confusing because, you know, if you don't realize that and you apply it to some data with a linear trend in it, it might say, yep, this is this looks stationary. And you might say, well, wait a minute, it can't be stationary. It's increasing. Um, that's why, because it has one extra step in it um, that it does when you have that implementation in R. Wow, so we're really working through the lecture. What I might actually do is then just save the R code for um, a mini version of the next lecture, and maybe I'll expand on it rather than just rushing it at the end here. I mean, technically, I could go on for you know ninety or a hundred or more minutes, but um, at this point, I'm like, I might as well just wrap up what we're talking about. Um, and to do that, I have one more quick example of a different unit root test for stationarity that I wanted to. Put in here. I'm not going to give a lot of the mathematical details because, well, it's a little bit opaque to be honest um, if you try to dig up the mathematical details. Um, but there is a Phillips Perone test. And the uh, Phillips Perone test is an alternative, alternative unit root test to the um, Dickey-Fuller test above. Um, and I should note these both exist. Um, I actually forgot to point that out up here. Both in the T-series package. So both of these um, exist in the T-series package in R. You can apply both of them to your data um, fairly quickly and see what sort of results you get. Now, the Philip Perone test kind of goes a little bit beyond, I guess you could say, what the augmented Dickey-Fuller test does. Um, it basically tries to be... Um, it 
I'll say tries to be more robust to um, deviations from the linear regression assumptions. In particular, two things. Um, which are um, hetero or um, the um, heteroscedasticity, scedasticity, if I'm not really spelling that right, but that's close enough, um, and um, well, correlated errors, correlated errors. So again, the augmented Dickey Fuller test, right, is a little bit based on the idea of, um, well, I guess it, it, it's kind of based a little bit on the idea of regression. Um, but the idea is, is that uh, least squares regression may not make sense um, if you have heteroscedastic errors, if you have correlations in your errors. So instead, the Philip Perron test tries to take an alternative approach. It uses different techniques, something called the Nui West estimator for the variance. It's basically a different way to estimate the variance in linear regression or the covariance in linear regression um, where the classic assumptions are not met. Because remember, if we go back to like linear regression 101, we have the Gauss-Markov theorem. It tells us that we want to have uncorrelated errors, um, IID, well, not IID, uncorrelated um, equal variance, uh, homogeneous variance errors um, to, uh, to sort of do the classic least squares theory. Um, since that's not the case, typically in the data that we'll be looking at in time series, you have things like this Philip Perron test, which try to account for that when it uses tools from, when it borrows things from linear regression and says, ah, we don't really want to do linear, like the least squares estimator doesn't make sense if we have strong correlations and heteroscedastic errors. So we should try to correct for that. Um, and that's what that does. Now, to be honest, I haven't spent a lot of time in my own career actually running these tests, one versus the other. So I'm not sure what the best one would be. It's something that might be an interesting um, excursion to actually run this on some test data and see how they actually work in practice. Now, since I've more or less used up the approximate 80 minutes that I've been aiming for, let's say 70 to 80 minutes for these lectures, I think I'm going to stop for now. Also, it's getting quite late on the clock here. Um, and in the next, what I might do is try to do a mini lecture um, where I test some of these, uh, test some data with these tests in R. Because all of these data, all of these functions are in R. I should say the Philip Perron test is the uh, PP test in R. It's also in the T-series package. Um, so you can run all of these on different toy sets of data to see what actually happens. So maybe we'll do that in the next lecture. So stay tuned for that and I'll uh, see you there. Okay.